thanks again for having me. Also, thanks for getting me out of bed early. I was able to get a run in before this. So if I sweat a little bit, that, that explains that. Um, so in terms of the objectives for the morning, um, we're gonna talk about cranial neuropathies. Uh, and as a neurologist, we'll talk about it from the neurological perspective. And since um, you know we have a relatively small group, if you guys have questions, by all means, feel free to interrupt me. I can't see you all, but I can certainly hear you if you unmute yourselves. Um, so we'll review the relevant anatomy of the cranial nerves. Um, we'll talk about some presenting signs and symptoms of cranial neuropathies. And then we'll largely go through the neurological differential diagnoses for many cranial neuropathies. Um, I have no uh, relevant disclosures as it pertains to this lecture. So there's really just a little bit of overlap, I think, between our two disciplines. Um, I think a lot of what I do and a lot of what you do are vastly different, but where we do share some common ground uh, would be in the realm of patients with uh, cranial neuropathies. There's a little bit of more overlap, though, between me and your department. Uh, this is a scan of my, my head, uh, and I'm uh, always grateful to Dr. Sherris for shelling this thing out of my face. This is an inverted papilloma that I let grow a little too much before uh, he was able to take it out for me and uh, sparing my beautiful face in the same time. So thank you to Dr. Sherris. Um, so we're just going to kind of go down the uh, list of cranial nerves down from one to 12. And I will say that in terms of the first cranial nerve, I think we as neurologists don't do a good enough job of examining it um, very often unless a patient comes in presenting of anosmia. Um, but there are many non-structural causes of, of neurogenic anosmia that we're beginning to learn are probably uh, early symptoms in many neurodegenerative disorders, uh, particularly Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. Uh, there's some good studies that actually show that um, up to a decade before people start presenting with other features of either of those disorders, Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, that anosmia is one of the earliest symptoms. And in the case of Parkinson's disease, oftentimes um, we're able to get a history of uh, history of anosmia as well as constipation for a decade or so before uh, they develop motor symptoms of the disease. Patients with multiple sclerosis, uh, an inflammatory disorder of the brain, can also develop anosmia, um, often uh, with lesions in the uh, olfactory tracts. And there are also post-infectious causes. Uh, so after folks have um, survived meningitis, whether that's uh, an infectious meningitis or a meningeal irritation as a result of a subarachnoid hemorrhage or the like, uh, can often develop anosmia as a consequence. Um, so, uh, and these are, these are things worth, uh, worth remembering. Similar, uh, or, or kind of bridging the gap between uh, the first and second cranial nerves is this entity known as Foster-Kennedy syndrome. So this is a fundoscopic examination of a patient with Foster-Kennedy syndrome. And as if the patient was looking at us, so the, the right is the left and the left is the right here, we can see papilledema here, uh, in the uh, right uh, fundus, as well as optic disc pallor in the left, uh, left fundus. And, and what Foster-Kennedy syndrome is a result of, uh, classically, are olfactory groove meningiomas, but in point of fact, Foster-Kennedy syndrome can be caused by any syndrome where there's a giant lesion, such as this, uh, in the uh, olfactory area. And basically, the ocular findings result from compression of the optic nerve, causing optic disc pallor, is here on the left, uh, and then the papilledema on the contralateral side is secondary to increased intracranial pressure, uh, so therefore uh, causing papilledema on the opposite side. So Foster-Kennedy syndrome is thought of as a triad of anosmia from the uh, structural lesion in the olfactory area, as well as uh, optic disc pallor on one side and papilledema on the other on fundoscopic exam. Moving to ocular motor neuropathies, and, and what I'm talking about here are not just uh, neuropathies of the third cranial nerve, but the third, fourth, and sixth cranial nerves that move our eyes. We generally break these down into structural versus non-structural lesions. In terms of structural lesions, we're talking about lesions really anywhere along the course of the nerve, uh, that ranging from what we refer to as nuclear lesions or lesions in the nucleus of that cranial nerve in the brainstem. In the case of the uh, third and fourth nerve, that's the midbrain, and in the sixth nerve, that's the pons. Uh, all the way out through cavernous sinus lesions. Remember, all of these nerves track through the cavernous sinus, and we'll show a picture of that in just a moment. Um, as well as orbital tumors or cerebral aneurysms compressing the nerves as they exit the skull or, or, or in the skull and, and prior to exiting the skull, as well as trauma. In fact, one of the most common uh, results of head trauma would be a fourth cranial nerve palsy, a trochlear nerve palsy. Uh, where patients develop uh, diplopia and a, a, a compensatory head tilt. Uh, 
in terms of non-structural causes of ocular motor neuropathies, uh, as we talked about uh, uh, increased intracranial pressure causing papilledema and visual obscuration, increased intracranial pressure can also lead to uh, compression of the uh, one of the uh, three nerves that move the eyes, particularly the sixth cranial nerve. So we often call it a pseudo sixth cranial nerve palsy where an elevated intracranial pressure will put uh, pressure on that sixth nerve and lead to uh, diplopia and often difficulty with lateral gaze obvious on examination. But other non-structural causes of ocular motor neuropathies include nerve ischemia. Uh, that's quite common in folks with diabetes. Uh, they'll present with acute painful diplopia uh, and that can involve any of the three nerves, the third, fourth, or sixth. Other causes of uh, eye movement abnormalities that are non-structural include Wernicke's encephalopathy, uh, which is commonly seen uh, in uh, the situations of thiamine deficiency often due to chronic alcohol use or malabsorption syndromes. Where we see a lot of Wernicke's <clears throat> encephalopathy these days are in patients that are post-gastric bypass who um, are not faithful with their supplementation. Uh, Miller-Fisher syndrome is a rare variant of Guillain-Barre syndrome that is a triad of ataxia, ophthalmoparesis, and areflexia. And then myasthenia gravis, which is a disorder I see a lot of, uh, an autoimmune disorder with antibodies against the acetylcholine receptor, which generally causes uh, intermittent and fatigable ocular motor neuropathy. So diplopia and ptosis being a very common presentation of that disorder. Uh, here are some uh, photographs, uh, or at least a cartoon and a, and a scan of a patient with a cavernous sinus thrombosis. Um, as we talked about before, um, really four or branches of four of uh, the 12 cranial nerves run through the cavernous sinus, uh, all three that move the eyes, three, four, and six, as well as two branches of the uh, uh, cranial nerve five, the trigeminal nerve, uh, the ophthalmic and maxillary branch. Uh, so cavernous sinus thrombosis, uh, something to think about when you have a patient um, with uh, multiple oculomotor neuropathies uh, and other accompanying symptoms. Moving from the ocular motor nerves onto the trigeminal nerve, um, we generally make a distinction between a trigeminal neuropathy and trigeminal neuralgia. Uh, we'll talk about uh, trigeminal neuralgia in some subsequent slides, but when I refer to a trigeminal neuropathy, I'm referring to a lesion of the trigeminal nerve that is due to an underlying disorder and doesn't necessarily cause pain, but more often than not causes patchy uh, facial uh, uh, numbness uh, or paresthesias. Uh, or in the case of the involvement of the uh, third branch, uh, potentially chewing difficulty as well. Uh, it's well known that Sjogren's syndrome tends to cause a, a neuronitis. So this is inflammation of the uh, cell bodies uh, of the uh, sensory nerves, in this case, the trigeminal nerve. So patients with Sjogren's syndrome or patients without a previous diagnosis of Sjogren's syndrome often can present with facial numbness. Uh, and in a few cases, I've seen patients present with facial numbness as their, as their first sign of Sjogren's syndrome. Uh, there's also a well-known association with anti-HU antibodies. So this is a perineoplastic syndrome, again, causing inflammation of the sensory ganglia, um, similar to Sjogren's syndrome. Uh, anti-HU antibodies are commonly seen in patients with underlying lung cancer, uh, but have been associated with any number of uh, adenocarcinomas. And then HIV uh, can also cause a very similar uh, syndrome as can B6 related sensory neuropathy. <clears throat> so B6 is kind of a, a weird vitamin. Um, in deficiency, it tends to cause a distal symmetric polyneuropathy, so numbness and tingling in the feet that gradually ascends. But in excess, uh, so B6 toxicity, which is often seen in people that take mega doses for supplementation, they generally develop a patchy, uh, painful neuropathy, often involving the face. So when I see patients with complaints of, of facial symptoms, uh, facial numbness, facial tingling, uh, I'll often get a scan, an MRI scan of the brain and, and uh, these uh, tests as well, uh, depending on the history. I don't send HIV tests on everyone, but if there's a history that's suggestive of a risk for HIV, I might send that, but I certainly send Sjogren's antibodies and B6. And again, if there's a history that makes me uh, think of potential for lung cancer or a perineoplastic syndrome, I will send anti hu antibodies, which have been around quite a while and are relatively inexpensive to order. And then there are other causes that are more structural uh, of trigeminal neuropathy. There's the um, infamous numb chin syndrome, uh, which is uh, caused by metastatic disease to the mental branch to the trigeminal nerve, uh, as well as other structural lesions, uh, such as vascular loops. But vascular loops tend to cause more of a trigeminal neuralgia uh, than a trigeminal neuropathy. Uh, 
So moving on to trigeminal neuralgia, uh, the other name for it you might see is tic de la Roe. Uh, and uh, trigeminal neuralgia is really uh, quite a severe disease in most cases. It, it causes, as you well know, uh, severe episodic pain and distribution of one of the uh, branches of the trigeminal nerve, most often the maxillary division. And these, uh, this pain is often described as lancinating, uh, is intense as uh, I have a patient that describes it as he feels like a hot poker is being thrust into his face uh, repetitively. Um, and this can be uh, not triggered um, or it can be triggered by otherwise innocuous stimuli such as just wind blowing on one's face or chewing or drinking. Um, as, as I mentioned, um, unlike trigeminal neuropathy where you'll often find uh, frank sensory loss on the face on examination, often people with trigeminal neuralgia will have a normal neurological exam. Uh, especially in the, in the branches of the, the fifth nerve. Um, they may guard though, however, if they have uh, significant pain in their face, uh, they may um, uh, not want you to touch it or, or, or use a, a safety pin to try to evaluate. Um, but uh, strictly speaking, there should be no evidence of, of uh, nerve dysfunction uh, to make the diagnosis of trigeminal neuralgia. There are many causes, um, <laughs> more and more with more sophisticated uh, and high, high resolution imaging like 3T MRI. We're seeing that most cases are, are due to microcompression by vascular loops. Um, however, uh, many cases uh, in the pre-MRI era and, and probably pre-3T MRI area were classified as idiopathic. But it's important to remember that there are other causes of trigeminal neuralgia besides vascular loops, though that's the most common cause. And those include structural lesions along the course of the nerve, as well as um, multiple sclerosis. So, um, not a lesion in the nerve itself, but a lesion in what we call the root entry zone. So that's where the trigeminal nerve uh, branches enter the brainstem uh, in the pons, and demyelination in that area of the pons um, uh, uh, can lead to trigeminal neuralgia. So uh, I think a, a clinical pearl I always tell my residents is that uh, if you see a, a young person, a young woman in particular with new onset trigeminal neuralgia, uh, that is multiple sclerosis until proven otherwise. So that definitely warrants a scan. Uh, here's a, an example with a, a giant arrow uh, showing a vascular loop compressing the trigeminal nerve here on the left side. Um, and so uh, again, when we, when we entertain the diagnosis, we're often scanning patients to look not only for the vascular loops, but for any other structural lesion uh, inside the brainstem or, or just outside the brainstem, such as a, a tumor or, uh, or an MS plaque. In terms of treating trigeminal neuralgia, uh, first-line therapy is an older anticonvulsant uh, called carbamazepine, also known as Tegretol, uh, at the doses listed there. Uh, second line, uh, which is becoming more and more first-line these days, is a newer generation of carbamazepine called oxcarbazepine, also known as Trileptal. Uh, Trileptal generally has uh, fewer side effects, such as sedation uh, and uh, white blood cell abnormalities than carbamazepine, so more and more of us are using it as first-line. And then third line therapy um, would include any of these agents here, other anticonvulsants or baclofen, which is anti-spasm drug. And then in those cases that are refractory to medical therapy, particularly if there's evidence of a structural lesion, uh, there's microvascular decompression, uh, which the uh, endovascular neurosurgeons here in Buffalo are quite good at, as uh, well as various other types of uh, interventions as listed here. I will say parenthetically, and I probably should have listed this on, uh, on the slide as well, that I've had at least three cases in the past 10 years uh, of, of otherwise refractory trigeminal neuralgia without clear evidence of vascular compression that I've treated successfully with low doses of Botox. Um, so um, it, it tends to cause a bit of a facial droop, but uh, in the three patients that I've uh, gotten out of agony, they really don't care, um, that they're, they're quite happy. And it's, um, it, it's kind of a, a finicky dose. Um, but, uh, but I've gotten, uh, I've had a lot of success using Botox in, in refractory cases. So I'm just gonna uh, shift gears from trigeminal neuropathies and talk about facial neuropathies from a, from a neurological perspective. Um, so there, there are multiple causes of facial palsy. I'll, I'll let you, you know, kind of read the list. Strictly speaking, I, I think most, I don't wanna say most people, many people, uh, referred to any facial palsy as a Bell's palsy, but that's really not accurate. Bell's palsy, by definition, is an otherwise idiopathic facial palsy not caused by any of these other syndromes, as you see listed here. Um, but uh, I, I think it's important to uh, 
keep this differential diagnosis in mind, and we'll talk about uh, some, some nuances of facial palsies that might uh, make you think of one of these alternate diagnoses for one of these conditions more than others. Uh, Bell's palsy is named uh, here after Sir Charles Bell, uh, who first described it. He's also the, the, the Bell that uh, is responsible for Bell's phenomenon, uh, which is uh, uh, inversion of the eyes or upward tilt of the eyes with eye, eye closure. So you see Bell's palsy is not that rare of a disease, uh, or fa uh, facial palsy is not that rare of the disease. Um, it's not uncommon for us to see um, uh, on the inpatient wards, we don't see too much Bell's palsy, I would say, uh, on the outpatient, uh, in the outpatient service in, in, uh, in neurology. I think instances where we see Bell's palsy in the clinic are when um, it's complicated or uh, it's complete. Um, more often than not, we see it uh, in the emergency department uh, when uh, patients present with facial weakness uh, of, of what is presumed acute onset, as often patients will describe that have had Bell's palsy, and the, the differential diagnosis is stroke. I think any unilateral neurological phenomenon is considered stroke until proven otherwise, and I think with good reason, um, but obviously Bell's palsy involves the, the face only and not the arm or leg as you typically see in a stroke. Um, as you see, there's really, it's kind of an equal opportunity offender disorder. Uh, there are some uh, higher risk populations such as those that uh, are, are pregnant uh, or, or just have been pregnant. And as I mentioned, strictly speaking, Bell's palsy is an idiopathic facial palsy. Uh, the leading theory, though, is it might be reactivation uh, or infection with uh, HSV-1, but other viral infections, other herpes viruses, as you see listed there, have also been postulated to uh, play a role in, in the etiology of Bell's palsy. Uh, this is completely ripped off from up to date. Uh, and uh, obviously, you see a, a case of a pretty Pretty pronounced Bell's palsy here on the left-hand side. Uh, the, from a neurological standpoint, obviously, uh, we, we teach the students that uh, a lower motor neuron facial palsy, such as a Bell's palsy, will affect the upper and the lower portion of the face, whereas a uh, upper motor neuron Bell's pal uh, facial palsy, uh, such as that might be caused by a stroke or a structural lesion uh, in the brain of the brainstem, uh, spares the upper head or upper face uh, and affects the lower face alone. There may be further evidence of uh, seventh nerve dysfunction uh, in, in Bell's palsy or facial palsy. Uh, obviously, the, the major function of the facial nerve is movement of the face, but uh, there are other, other functions that the nerve serves. Uh, so in more severe lesions, patients may have hyperacusis uh, because of involvement of the nerve dyspedius, which, uh, as you well know, uh, is normally there to dampen uh, the tympanic membrane. Uh, patients may uh, describe dyscusia or abnormal taste <clears throat> because of involvement of the corda tympani, and there may be impaired lacrimation as well um, because of impaired uh, innervation uh, to the uh, lacrimal glands. Um, the house brackman scale is something that I don't really think we often use in neurology. I think we, we often kind of think of it as, as black and white, and maybe we shouldn't. We think of complete or incomplete lesions. Um, a complete lesion being a, a grade six here and a incomplete lesion being pretty much everything else except for a one, I suppose, which is nothing at all. Um, where this becomes relevant, uh, though, for, for neurologists are uh, sometimes we're asked to perform uh, nerve conduction studies and electromyography on patients with severe facial palsies. And this uh, I found to be you know, somewhat useful in terms of eating and prognosis. There are some very good studies that were done really decades ago, but have been reproduced recently, um, that demonstrate that uh, motor nerve conduction studies, so uh, measurement of what's called the CMAP or compound motor action potential with facial nerve stimulation, uh, comparing the affected side with the non-affected side at two weeks is a generally useful guide to prognosis. So you see here that if, um, if the CMAP amplitude on the affected side is greater is is uh, greater than thirty percent of what the unaffected side is. There's an excellent outcome. If it's less than ten percent, it's a poor outcome. And between ten and thirty percent is generally a good outcome with incomplete recovery. So, so what this might mean in practice would be if I stimulated the facial nerve, and this is what it looks like. It looks fairly barbaric. If we stimulate the facial nerve there, just anterior to the tragus, and record from the uh, in this case uh, looks like orbicularis uh, oculi. Um, we, if I got a, uh, let's say an amplitude of two millivolts on the affected side, uh, 
Uh, if I got really anything above 0.2 millivolts, uh, or I'm sorry, 0.6 millivolts on the contralateral side, on the affected side, that would bode for a good prognosis. If I got, let's say, 0.2 or less on the affected side, that would, that would bode for a poor prognosis. So uh, these are interesting cases, um, generally not the most pleasant for patients, but interesting for, for me and interesting for my fellows. So uh, if you have cases of severe Bell's palsy and need, uh, need patients evaluated, we're happy to take care of them for you. Generally, uh, so this is some old literature, it's about 40 years old uh, uh, for, from, um, from your literature actually, is a study of over a thousand patients uh, looking at uh, the natural history of Bell's palsy. And it looked at, uh, uh, in this population, patients, uh, a third of them had incomplete lesions and two thirds had complete paralysis. And as you can see, those with incomplete paralysis, the vast majority, 94% recovered. Uh, however, those that had complete paralysis, uh, 60%. Um, which is still, you know, it's, it's more than half. So that's pretty good, pretty good numbers. Um, interestingly, you know, 85% of patients showed some signs of recovery within three weeks. And that's important as we'll talk about shortly. Of all the patients uh, pulling, pulling all the numbers together, 70, about 70% 70 had complete recovery, 13% had what was characterized as slight sequelae, and 16% and had some more uh, uh, prominent sequelae such as weakness, synkinesis, uh, or facial contracture. So I, I generally, as a rule, we say that if there's no return of function, uh, and I don't mean complete recovery, but I mean some return of function uh, within three weeks, uh, you should probably look for other causes. Uh, so um, with imaging uh, or, or other, other testing that's warranted. I mentioned synkinesis. Uh, synkinesis obviously is uh, mostly seen in lesion, severe lesions that, that recover, and it's due to uh, outgrowth of, of neurons um, that are really misguided. Uh, so uh, basically what happens is an attempted movement of one part of the face, there's movement of another. So uh, if a patient who had an incomplete recovery with synkinesis, who every time he attempts to raise his eyebrow, his, his, uh, the corner of his mouth uh, uh, goes up as well. Uh, but this isn't necessarily only true for uh, motor fibers. This can also occur with redirection of axons to autonomic structures as well. So one example is crocodile tears. So uh, another patient um, with uh, an incomplete recovery who, in addition to synkinesis, uh, develops tearing every time she's hungry because uh, there's misguiding of the uh, innervation to the lacrimal glands and the salivary glands. Uh, so it's kind of upsetting to her, no pun intended. Uh, some nuances to facial palsy. So recurrent uh, Bell's palsy is uh, seen in about 7% of cases, usually within 10 years. This is often observed during pregnancy. Uh, you can see recurrent facial palsies uh, in patients with um, these disorders listed below. Uh, and these patients are also uh, prone to uh, bilateral facial palsies, so affecting uh, both sides of the face. But as you can see, that's the, the vast minority of cases. Really, when you see bilateral facial palsies, you should be thinking about uh, the top four there. Um, patients with uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome, uh, which is a, a post-infectious uh, sensory and motor neuropathy, uh, often have facial involvement uh, and often bilaterally, but it's not uh, in isolation. It usually occurs in conjunction with uh, fairly prominent involvement of the uh, limbs, uh, torso, and sometimes the uh, bulbar <clears throat> and respiratory muscles as well. And then Melkerson-Rosenthal syndrome is uh, this bizarre disorder of really unknown etiology, which uh, uh, leads to uh, episodic bilateral facial palsies, facial swelling, as well as a characteristic uh, fissured appearing tongue. Um, there have been a lot of studies on the appropriate treatment of Bell's palsy. I kind of reduced it down to one slide. Uh, the bottom line is, uh, though there have been studies looking at uh, multiple types of antivirals, uh, looking at acyclovir, looking at valcyclovir, uh, in addition to or in lieu of corticosteroids, there's really no evidence that antivirals uh, are of much benefit uh, in the treatment of Bell's palsy at this point in time. So the bottom line is there's good evidence that steroids work, um, and I generally recommend treating Bell's palsy uh, as soon as possible, as soon as possible after onset to uh, allow for a better recovery with about 60 milligrams of prednisone for 10 days. Now, obviously, if you're talking about a child or a, a person who's uh, of, of underweight uh, status, you might want to adjust that dose a little bit. But for most adults, we go with 60 uh, a day for 10 days. Uh, 
um, just paying attention and keeping in mind if patients have uh, diabetes and, and, and trying to adjust for that as well. So shifting gears from the seventh nerve to the eighth nerve, uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, peripheral vestibulopathy. Um, I think one of, uh, one of the most important things we're, we're trying to educate, um, particularly folks in the emergency department, uh, is that in isolation, vertigo is never due to a central process. So the, the big two differential diagnoses, or the big two categories of vestibulopathy would be a central cause and a peripheral cause. And um, we, we see many, many patients with, uh, with vertigo in isolation, most often with uh, benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, who come into the emergency department and get you know, million dollar workups for stroke. Uh, so I think that uh, keeping in mind that while vertigo can be a manifestation of a stroke, it never, never is in isolation, uh, an important point. From a peripheral standpoint, uh, by and large, uh, most patients we deal with are patients uh, that have uh, BPPV uh, and uh, are generally easy, easily diagnosed with uh, bedside maneuvers like a dix hall pike maneuver or head thrust maneuvers. Um, other causes of peripheral vestibulopathy that you're all well aware of uh, are, include vestibular neuritis or vestibular neuronitis, which is uh, post-infectious uh, involvement of the eighth cranial nerve, uh, Meniere's disease, uh, medication toxicity. I don't really think many people are using aminoglycosides anymore, but a, a pretty uh, historically common uh, cause of peripheral vestibulopathy. And then other causes include perilymphistula and then tumors in the cerebellopontine angle, which we'll touch on a little bit more, I think, towards the end of the talk when I talk about multiple cranial neuropathies. Um, so I, I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk about uh, the lower cranial nerves. And I think um, an important point, um, or, or let me just say that uh, I think uh, very good interactions I've had over the past uh, decade in practice um, involve uh, working uh, with, with you all uh, in uh, otolaryngology and, and helping me uh, diagnose and treat patients with uh, dysphagia, with neurogenic dysphagia. And so from a neurological standpoint, when we have a patient um, who's referred to us for dysphagia, uh, we, we try, at least first and foremost, to differentiate, is it neurogenic uh, or is it uh, gastroenterological? And uh, one of the useful kind of tricks on history for us is asking patients, where, where does food get stuck? Um, so when patients talk about food getting stuck in their mouth, that is, that is a higher likelihood of there being a neurological cause, where if they say it gets stuck in their throat, while that certainly still could be neurological, oftentimes that's, that's gastroenterological in nature. And we work also uh, frequently in conjunction with uh, gastroenterologists to sort through this as well. I think the second bullet point is really important. So from a neurological standpoint, um, patients will often uh, more prominently and earlier experience dysphagia for liquids much more than solids. And they'll often complain of liquid regurgitation through their nose. Uh, so um, asking where does it get stuck and what is involved more liquids or solids, at least early on, uh, and then talking about nasal re regurgitation of liquid. Now, now, really, all bets are off depending on the disorder as it progresses, right? So if we're talking about a patient here, let's say with early ALS, early motor neuron disease, Lou Gehrig's disease, they will say that things get stuck in their, their mouth, that liquids are worse than solids, and they have nasal regurgitation of liquid. If that disease, or not if, unfortunately, when that disease progresses, uh, if they are still eating or trying to eat, uh, they will say eventually that solids are just as effective as liquids, and, and uh, sometimes they'll even have uh, nasal regurgitation of solids as well, which is uh, certainly unpleasant for all involved. When we think of uh, where, where the lesion is um, or, or where uh, patients are experiencing their dysphagia in the oral phase or the pharyngeal phase, in the oral phase, uh, we think about hypoglossal nerve lesions. We could also think of facial nerve lesions if pe people have uh, severe facial weakness and are, are not able to, to um, seal their mouth. But generally, we're thinking about hypoglossal nerve lesions. Uh, in the pharyngeal phase, uh, that really can occur anywhere along the, the track or, or the course of the nerve, uh, ranging from supranuclear lesions. So that basically means cortical control of, of the, the cranial nerve. So if you think about uh, the, the neurogenic uh, pathway for swallowing, uh, that involves you know, both cortical as well as brainstem control. So if there are uh, 
severe lesions in the cortex uh, or the brainstem that are above the level of the nucleus and not, not allowing for that input to enter the nucleus, uh, there can be uh, significant dysphagia. So an example of that would be uh, patients with uh, fairly widespread strokes, uh, either in both cortices or in the brainstem, uh, or patients with advanced multiple sclerosis with lesions throughout. Um, but it also uh, can involve extrapyramidal disease. And so what I'm referring to there are uh, generally Parkinson's disease and, and similar disorders. So if patients uh, can't coordinate a swallow because of abnormal uh, motor planning circuitry, uh, as would occur in Parkinson's disease, uh, they can often have dysphagia, typically in the moderate to severe course uh, of their disease, later on in their disease. And less commonly, at least for us to see, uh, would be uh, nuclear lesions uh, in the 10th um, uh, uh, cranial nerve uh, or uh, uh, actual nerve lesions in the 9th or 10th cranial nerves as well. So th th those were neurogenic causes uh, now, moving on to myogenic cause, obviously, you know, from a motor standpoint, we think about nerve innervating muscle. Uh, we talked about myasthenia gravis before. Uh, myasthenia, uh, again, being an autoimmune disorder uh, with uh, antibodies to acetylcholine receptors in most cases. Uh, myasthenia is a weird disorder insofar as it really likes to attack the ocular muscles, but after the ocular muscles, uh, its next favorite target are the bulbar muscles. Uh, so patients with myasthenia that have generalized disease will frequently uh, complain of dysphagia. And again, the, the unique aspect of myasthenia is the fatigability uh, uh, of the disorder. So what that really means is the more you use it, the more you lose it. Patients with myasthenia will often say that after rest, particularly in the morning, their symptoms are minimal, uh, if, if even non-existent in many cases. But as the day goes on, uh, they experience more and more symptoms. And if you really talk with people with myasthenia in terms of, uh, as it's relevant to dysphagia, they'll often say that early on in a meal, they have no trouble, but as a meal progresses, they have difficulty, uh, more difficulty getting food down. Uh, they also will, will frequently say they have more difficulty actually chewing as well because of fatigue of the uh, chewing muscles. And then in terms of myopathies, uh, dysphagia is a relatively rare uh, um, uh, manifestation of myopathy or muscle disease in and of itself. But where we do see it uh, uh, are, is an inclusion body myositis, which typically affects uh, older patients, uh, typically men more than women uh, after the age of 60, or oculopharyngeal muscular dystrophy. This is an exceedingly rare form of muscular dystrophy that tends to cluster in patients of French Canadian or uh, Southwest Native American uh, heritage. Um, I have only ever seen one case of OPMD in Buffalo, and it was a, in a patient of French-Canadian uh, descent. Uh, and then inflammatory myopathies or mitochondrial myopathies uh, also uh, can develop uh, dysphagia. It's estimated in inflammatory myopathies, such as poly or dermatomyositis, some, some form of dysphagia, or at least dysphagia to some extent, occurs in about one in three patients. Moving from dysphagia to dysphonia and dysarthria, um, we generally characterize these uh, based, again, on the level of the lesion. So with an upper motor neuron lesion, a lesion in the brain or brainstem, uh, patients typically have a, a spastic dysarthria, a very kind of strained uh, manner of speech which reflects spasticity in the uh, muscles uh, important for phonation. Uh, this is most often seen in patients with uh, ALS, again, Lou Gehrig's disease, or a similar disorder called PLS, which is primary lateral sclerosis. Uh, that is in distinction with patients with lower motor neuron lesions, uh, which we typically will characterize as a flaccid dysarthria or flaccid dysphonia. And that can be further characterized, though this is largely <clears throat> an, educa an educational exercise that we go through with the medical students in terms of uh, differentiating labial dysarthria from uh, dysfunction of the lips to guttural dysarthria with dysfunction of the throat muscles and lingual dysarthria uh, with uh, lesions of, of the tongue or, or difficulty with the tongue. And in, and in patients with a disease like ALS, which is both upper and lower motor neuron, they may have a combination of spastic uh, or uh, a, a flaccid dysarthria as well, often in conjunction with uh, neurogenic dysphagia. So uh, these, these patients uh, might make it into your office before they make it into mine. And again, that's, I think, where the collaboration has been, been good over the past uh, several years in practice for me. Uh, patients with extrapyramidal disease, again, Parkinson's disease and similar disorders will often have uh, 
speech difficulties. In fact, one of the hallmarks of Parkinson's disease is what's called hypophonia, or a very soft voice uh, that typically progresses over the course of the illness. And then um, I dare say that many people have experienced or witnessed uh, cerebellar dysarthria or dysphonia uh, as uh, alcohol is a, a prime cause of this. Uh, so um, not only with uh, alcohol intoxication affecting the cerebellum and causing this, but also with any lesions of the cerebellum. So from a, a neurological standpoint, that often involves multiple sclerosis again, uh, where uh, lesions tend to uh, prefer uh, heavily myelinated tracts like the cerebellar tracts. So you may see that there as well. I talked a little bit uh, about ALS, obviously that's Lou Gehrig there. Uh, when we think about neurogenic dysphonia and dysarthria, these are the main disorders we talk about or think about. Um, we, we always wanna find a patient to have myasthenia gravis because we can treat that and treat that fairly well. Uh, but unfortunately, ALS is a relentlessly progressive disorder as we'll talk about in a minute. We can't really uh, treat it uh, other than symptomatically per se. Uh, obviously, uh, lesions of the lower cranial nerves can cause these issues as well. And Parsonage-Turner syndrome, uh, and in a typical form, uh, I've seen do this many times over the course of the past 10 or 12 years. And why I say I, I should qualify that many times, meaning maybe once a year, where a patient will have have this syndrome, which um, it's kind of an esoteric neurological phenomenon. Basically, uh, the story for most Parsonage-Turner syndrome is a patient uh, receives a vaccine or a patient has an upper respiratory illness. And then about two or three weeks later, they develop very severe shoulder pain uh, in one shoulder. And over the course of the next few days, the pain recedes, but they experience uh, weakness and wasting in that arm. So it's, it's almost like a focal form of Guillain-Barre syndrome uh, affecting one arm. Uh, sometimes it can affect two arms, but mostly it's one arm. And in conjunction uh, with the involvement of the arm, uh, there can also be involvement of uh, laryngeal muscles, pharyngeal muscles, and also respiratory muscles. So sometimes patients will have uh, 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 elevated diaphragm on one side because of involvement of the phrenic nerve. So think of a case with uh, you know, dysphagia, dysarthria, uh, maybe some breathing difficulty. You can't quite put your finger on it. And they also talk about how their arm is hurting or has been weak. Um, not a bad idea to think about it. It's generally a self-limited sin which improves over the course of a year or so. Uh, here's some pretty prominent <clears throat> pictures of tongue atrophy. Uh, these are things I don't like to see because they generally don't have a good prognosis. Uh, <clears throat> in the case of that panel uh, that's a little bit more elevated, I would be most concerned about ALS or motor neuron disorder uh, given the uh, uh, whole atrophy of the tongue, uh, as well as uh, what would probably be fasciculations in the tongue as well. Uh, and even on the right side, uh, the lower side, uh, with hemiatrophy of the tongue, that's not something as a neurologist I really like to see. Uh, in my experience, having seen that in the past, we're usually talking about infiltration of the hypoglossal nerve on that side. Uh, I've seen it occur with lung cancer. I've seen it occur with melanoma uh, in fairly advanced uh, uh, stages as well. Just uh, focusing in on that center portion that's highlighted in red, um, again, about one in three patients with ALS will have a bulbar onset of symptoms with the uh, symptoms listed there. Uh, so it's something to keep in mind and, and keep an eye out for because it's not all that uncommon. And unfortunately, when ALS has a bulbar onset, uh, the prognosis tends to be even worse. Uh, generally speaking, uh, patients with ALS, uh, all comers, uh, have a prognosis of about three years after the time of diagnosis. Uh, patients with bulbar onset ALS, it's more like a year, a year and a half, uh, and it's, it's quite a devastating disorder. Just quickly moving on from uh, ALS to hypoglossal neuropathy, uh, this is a good paper uh, in our literature and uh, the uh, prime neuromuscular journal called Muscle and Nerve that uh, looked at a retrospective review of uh, about 250 cases of hypoglossal neuropathy. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, cancer tends to be the most common cause, um, but uh, other, other major causes were uh, post-CEA, uh, carotid underdirectomy, and post-irradiation. Um, perineoplastic causes were also uh, seen uh, in a number of patients, um, and, and you can see the predictive factors there were the most common symptoms, obviously, being dysphagia, dysarthria, and then tongue involvement as well. Um, so up to this point, I've talked about uh, each cranial nerve um, in isolation. Uh, and I think for many of the disorders I talked about, that, that holds true. Um, 
However, uh, oftentimes uh, cranial neuropathies can occur in conjunction with one another. And uh, this review uh, in archives, which is now 15 years old, uh, looked at uh, one person's, one neurologist's uh, experience with multiple cranial neuropathies, I believe from Mayo Clinic, about a thousand cases over the course of his career, over 34 years. And, and what he was able to catalog is that the most common cause of multiple cranial neuropathies uh, was tumor followed by vascular disease. And in terms of the types of tumors, you can see uh, that listed over to the right in, in table two with schwannomas being the most common, followed by metastases and meningioma, and, and, and you can read the rest. In terms of which cranial nerves are involved, um, generally, if you just look at the bottom there, uh, it's six more than seven, more than five, more than three, and you can see the different permutations and combinations uh, of what uh, Dr. Keene found uh, on his, uh, on his, uh, from his database or from his experience of treating patients with multiple cranial neuropathies. So, Generally speaking, uh, you'll, you'll see a six in com combination with a seven and maybe a five. Uh, the most common thing you wanna think about, unfortunately, is, is tumor, cancer, followed by vascular, uh, and, and do your uh, workup appropriately. So I did uh, shorten this talk just a little bit uh, because I was initially told we were looking at 45 minutes. I see I'm coming right in at about 45. Uh, but if you guys have questions, um, I certainly have some time to answer those, and I, I appreciate uh, your attention. Uh, over this uh, awkward but uh, useful platform. Thank you. Just want to say thank you, Nick. Getting up early. As, it sounds like Robin. It's Robin. Yep. Thank Ro you Robin, so much. I may not be a surgeon, but this isn't too early, but thank you. <laughs> Dr. Silvestri, I have a question. Of course. Um, could, could you explain a little bit more um, the mitochondrial um, disease that people are telling me they have and how it's being diagnosed, how it presents, how it progresses. Uh, mitochondrial disease in general? Yes. Yeah. I think um, just as a blanket statement and not casting aspersions on anyone in particular, I think mitochondrial disease is uh, way overdiagnosed in Buffalo. Um, you know, bona fide mitochondrial disease um, is... Um, generally presents with exercise intolerance. Uh, so people that um, over the course of time uh, were able to uh, perform uh, exercise activities, and that just may include something as simple as walking, uh, who over time uh, then develop uh, less ability to do so. Uh, but there's a really a range of mitochondrial disorders too, because there are some fairly devastating pediatric uh, mitochondrial disorders that begin early in life with uh, a fluid myopathy, often in conjunction with central nervous system problems, such as uh, seizures and strokes uh, and metabolic abnormalities. But I would say from an adult perspective, the two major phenotypes are um, progressive myopathy, so progressive uh, muscle weakness that tends to involve proximal more than distal muscles in all four extremities, uh, and the more common variant that I mentioned, exercise intolerance. Um, the diagnosis is really made uh, through uh, muscle biopsy with biochemical analysis of the muscle. And I think, um, you know, hopefully over the course of our careers, we'll see more and more of these diagnoses being made by genetic means uh, because more and more uh, mutations in both the mitochondrial DNA and the nuclear DNA that controls much of the mitochondrial machinery are being discovered really on a, on a monthly basis. Thank you so much. You're welcome. So I have a, I have a question. Sure. Emily. So in the face of uh, COVID-19 coronavirus, a lot of, well, I think 40% of patients will have loss of taste and smell. Any, any idea what causes this? And, and maybe even more importantly, what, what would one tell a patient as far as uh, chances for recovery? Yeah, that's that's a great question, and um, the, you know, I, it's timely too because I, I, you know, the latest Journal of Neurology was, had at least six or seven articles about this phenomenon. Uh, unfortunately, uh, with regard to the second question, we just simply don't know yet in terms of recovery because this is so fresh, this is so new. Um, in terms of why this is happening, uh, there have been a number of different. Um, uh, theories postulated. There's a group in New York that uh, have looked at, unfortunately, autopsy specimens of patients uh, with COVID uh, with um, documented um, uh, 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 smell abnormalities uh, as uh, antecedent. And um, there does appear to be inflammation of the olfactory nerves uh, in those cases, but it's, it's relatively nonspecific. And I think that more uh, needs to be understood about this. So 
I am kind of dodging your question, but but I will also say that uh, at least from a neurological standpoint, uh, it's a it's a uh, an area of active investigation because it's an interesting phenomenon in association with COVID. Yeah, thank you, um, thank Mark. I yeah. I just wanted it's it's Iris. I um I just wanted to tell you that the archives of laryngology and I. Uh, Laryng and Laryngoscope had published in 2017 a really interesting article on olfactory therapy. And it um, showed that uh, there was improvement in up to 30% of people. I can um, tell you that the, it's really cheap for the patients to get four uh, essential oils and twice a day they smell it. And it's like it's rose, lemon, uh, eucalyptus, and uh, clove. And they smell these in for 15 seconds, and then they think about these very memorable smells. And, about, and the study showed that there was significant improvement. And those were in patients that had uh, olfactory dysfunction for over a year. So these patients that are newer, they're usually coming in about six weeks out now. They're doing better uh, faster. Uh, by initiating this. And there are several phases of the olfactory therapy because you, after a few weeks, you change the smells up and they keep a log and it's really fascinating to see how they're improving. Uh, but they're early on in the disease and they probably, they might've been reco recovering anyway. And, and is, there, is there a thought, you know, with COVID, is it, is it loss of taste and smell or is it loss of, loss of smell that leads to the loss of taste? It's only olfactory, yeah. They still are telling me that they taste sweet and bitter, very rudimentary tongue stuff. That's what they tell me, the patients are telling me. Okay. There's so an smell, article from, smell there's an article the, from France involved. that um, actually has an MRI. I think they got the MRI before they realized the patient had COVID and it definitely shows inflammation in that area. It's, it's, it's out there, it's a pretty neat little article but it hasn't been replicated because I don't think they threw too many people into MRI machines because of cleaning after yeah. somebody walked in there. But it, it's out there and it's, it's a pretty good picture. 